All right, good afternoon, everybody. We're going to get things rolling here. Uh, while everybody finds a seat, we're going to go over some housekeeping things here. Before we do that, I'd like to remind you to follow us on Instagram at Lakeland Crops and find us on Facebook at Lakeland Crop Technology SMF. The bathrooms are located out the top doors and to your left just before the cafeteria. The muster point is across College Drive in the Lakeland College parking lot near the regional center. And a reminder to please put your cell phones on silent. So welcome to the 2023 Crops Student Managed Farm Powered by New Holland final presentations. I am Jace Hansen. I was this year's general manager and I'm from Yorkton, Saskatchewan. And I'm Rebecca Yardum. I'm this year's Assistant General Manager, and I'm from Minneapolis, Manitoba. So to start, I'd like to do the land acknowledgement. At Lakeland College, we acknowledge that the land we gather on is the traditional homeland, hunting, and ceremonial gathering places of the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit. The Plains and Woodland Cree, the Soto, Blackfoot, Métis, Dene and Nakota Sioux people have practiced their culture and languages on Treaty 6 and Métis Region 2 territories for generations and were the original caretakers of this land. The First Nation, Métis and Inuit peoples call this land home today and have done so for millennia. We would like to acknowledge the history we have created together on this land and to be thankful for the opportunity to walk together side by side in friendship, learning from our past and promoting positive relations for the past, the present and the future. I would also like to introduce some special guests that we have here today. Adam Waterman, the chairman of the Lakeland College Board of Governors. Brent Fisher, the Lakeland College Board of Governors. Dean Fosselt, the Lakeland College Board of Governors. Dr. Alice Wainwright Stewart, Lakeland College President, Dr. Todd Sumner, Vice President, External Relations and Infrastructure, and Georgina Altman, Vice President, External Relations and Infrastructure. Also, thank you to the generous donors, Roy Kabitza, Judy Sweet, and Armin and Rita Mueller. Their donations have allowed us to acquire some land recently. Uh, a couple years ago, we acquired a half section. The pink quarter is the Judy Sweet quarter. The blue quarter is the Roy Kabitza quarter. And uh, this year we've acquired some more new land about 20 minutes south of Vermilion, and that is the purple shaded area. So this year we've definitely had some challenges with managing a enterprise of this size with 34, 35 different individuals. Uh, you definitely see a lot of different opinions. I feel it's given us the opportunity to see diversity with the opinions and the personalities within the members of the group. Um, we also have bin, bin space, which this will be talked about further on in our presentation. Right now we're estimating we're about 25% short for our bin space, depending on our years and our crops that we're taking off. Um, another one that we have is our swathing. So throughout the years we've been in between swathers, and this year we actually didn't have one, so we were straight cutting everything. But we have good news, we've actually purchased a swather and it should be coming to Lakeland shortly. So on SMF, like I said, we have 35 individuals on there. So we split us up into seven teams. So we have the executives, which Jason and I are both on. Then we have mixed farm, analysis, finance, crop demo, marketing, and production. You'll see all these people split up within the presentation within different commodities. So this is our order of presentation. So we're going to start with our special projects, followed by our wheat. Then we'll see canola, then barley and corn. We're going to have a quick 15 minute intermission where you guys can go to the cafeteria, get some snacks, get some water. And then we'll come back and we'll jump right in with peas into hemp and flax. And then we'll also have our crop demo, followed by your conclusion. Are there any questions at this point? Perfect. We will have special projects come up. Good afternoon. We are going to talk. 
Good afternoon. We're the Special Projects Group. I'm Ethan Hebert, and I'm from Rosemary, Alberta, and I was part of the Mixed Farm Team. My name is Tori Musica, and I'm from Balfour, Saskatchewan, and I was this year's Crop Demo Manager. My name is Braylon Ekstrom, and I came from a grain farm in Wadena, Saskatchewan. I'm Nathan Van Stavern. I'm from Weyburn, Saskatchewan, and I was the public, public relations on the executive team. My name is Muromo Kebalogu. I'm from Nigeria, and I'm part of the analysis team. Uh, I'm Ryan Langell from Foremost, Alberta, and I was also part of the analysis team. My name is Walker Fairley. I am on the production team, and I am from Cunnave, Saskatchewan. So to kick it off here, we're going to talk about a forage seeding proposal that we are working on this year. Uh, this is just going to help our livestock uh, side of the SMF with some of the grazing. They're short on grazing, um, especially in the fall. Uh, this will also improve our soil health um, in our fields. We're going to do it on LC45 and AL01. So AL01 is the top um, where the arrow is pointing on the top field, and LC45 is the bottom one where the arrow is pointing. So we're going to talk about 4.5 first. Uh, this one has a little bit of high phosphorus levels. It's at 220 parts per million from the soil test this year that we took. Um, and then it also has a little bit of compaction on it. This is because it's really close to the farm. Um, it's easy to dump the cows there when we're needing to do stuff with the cattle. And it also was really easy when they would spread manure. Um, it was short trips for the trucks to haul the manure, so it got a lot of um, manure, manure applied on it, um, raising the phosphorus levels. This is going to be a little bit of a longer term plan. It's probably going to take about four or five years, um, and then it's probably going to start in a year or two. We're still kind of communicating with all the different groups and still trying to figure it all out, how it's all going to work. And then after the four or five years, we'll reassess and see if it needs to go longer or um, if we can break it up and start using it as cropland again. Um, and then it's probably going to contain some alfalfa in it, as alfalfa is a high phosphorus user. Uh, AL01, uh, this one has a little bit of a different problem. It has uh, high salinity. So as you can see, the far map is a yield map um, from this year again. Um, and then you can see where the two arrows are pointed. Those are pretty uh, red areas. Those mean that there was either nothing produced or very low production in those areas. Um, and then those correspond with the other picture here. That's where we're going to do the um, plant the forage. They're planning on doing this uh, this year, um, this coming year. It's going to be about 15 acres. It's going to be a little bit of a shorter plan, probably two, three years. And then we'll see if it helps with the salinity or not. We're going to use Imperial Seeds, their reclaimed seed for this. So this year, the extensive grazing unit with the ASTs came up to us with a proposal of putting fall rye on one of our fields. So fall rye um, is a cover crop, and basically it can help with reducing weeds and insects by breaking up that disease cycle, as well as for us, since we seed in the spring, we will have the nutrients come back through into our soil which can help us. And then for any livestock benefits, it can help us with reduced baleage. And we don't have as many cows on the field. So this will be put on LC12, which is going to be the barley silage. So the barley silage will be taken off in July. And then the fall rye will be planted anywhere from August 15th to September 1st. This year, I had the honor of being part of the Variable Rate Committee. Um, first of all, VR, it's a way of applying different rates of seed, uh, manure, fertilizer to the exact same field. And the reason that you would do something like that is so that you can use all of your resources to their utmost effect and get as many benefits as you can while saving money at the same time. Some advantages of this are with the changing rates and using all of your resources, you are also able to save that money. And then on top of that, you're also able to see what exactly is going on in your soil. It's determined by using the, um, like predetermined prescriptions like a soil test. So we looked at a lot of really great options here. The main that we wanted to go with was point forward solutions. 
The reason for that being is mainly because we had a previous relationship. LC14 had already been mapped by them. They have an amazing way of layering different types of maps as well, such as their protein maps. They also are able to give us our maps without having to pay for a prescription and allow us the access to the EC data as well. And for those wonderful reasons, we decided that Point Forwards was going to be the best option for us for variable rate at the college. So this year we were looking at different data management softwares and then we discovered that the software we currently use, which is AGI Compass, is going to be no longer available for us as they are shutting down. So we looked at multiple options and we came out at Climate Field View and TELUS Farm at Hand. And I'd like to point out that we already use Climate Field View, or the Ag Tech students use Climate Field View in their course, so that helped us pick them. We're going to use TELUS as mainly a bin management software and finances, and we're going to be using Climate Field View for machine integration, uh, weather reports, and uh, satellite imagery. And the benefits this will have on our farm is we'll be using these softwares on our own farms. Some of us will be, so it's great experience and good to see the new technologies. So at the college here we do field mapping. Uh, this is just to protect our, track our productive acres uh, just so that we know what exactly we are, how many productive acres we exactly have. Uh, we're using the Trimble GFX350 GPS system which is the picture on the uh, my left. Um, and then we're going to do it on AA, LC11, LC45, LC20, LC25, LC26, A, B, and C, which those are the research fields. Uh, LCP21, LCP22, LCP23, LCP24. Uh, all the P stands for is the pasture, so that's where the cows go um, when they go for grazing. So we decided that just because none of the fields have signs or any indication other than the map that we get at the beginning of the school year, we don't really know where these fields are and, we, and this could be quite a challenge when we go for labs or when custom workers come to do some work on the fields. So we decided that we are going to put field signs up and um, this is exactly what we are putting on there. So environmental farm plan, it is a self-assessment tool used by producers to identify and mitigate environmental issues. It is important to have an environmental farm plan as it increases producers' understanding about the legal requirements in related to environmental issues. Environmental farm plan promotes sustainability and environmental conservation. The action plan designed for environmental farm plan allows producers to identify and pinpoint areas that need improvement in their daily activities. There are a lot of numerous benefits for having an environmental farm plan. For instance, Canadian Agricultural Partnership um, has a grant that you can only be qualified to to get the grant if you have an environmental farm plan certificate. It also enhances marketing strategy, as nowadays um, consumers are more concerned about the safety and quality of the food they eat. So it's, um, any producer with an environmental farm plan has already shows the consumer that they take responsibility for um, their environment and being hygienic enough. There are um, some products, there, there are some crops and products that needed environmental farm plan. However, you as a farmer and a producer who is interested in promoting the, um, environmental conservation and sustainability should be able to get an environmental farm plan. Lakeland College uh, being a reputable, a, a reputable um, institution 
and a citadel of learning in 2016 obtained an environmental farm plant certificate and at the long run we introduced a diary ban and with the help of the mixed farm team we um, they were able to they were able to um, identify areas that needs to be reevaluated, and currently we are waiting on um, reapproval. We happen to be the first um, college in Abata to get an environmental farm plan registered. Also, having an environmental farm plan allowed producers to partner with some internationally recognized organization in the agricultural industry. This helps producers to widen their market choice and give them the opportunity to sell their products globally. All right, uh, on the farm, we have 17 bins. We have about 48,000 bushels of storage and about 55 bushels in expected yield. That's about a 7,000 bushel difference. So what we're planning on doing, we got two bins that have a uh, floor that's uh, wooden and broken every year. So we're deciding to put in, or we're planning on figuring out prices for new bin flooring and or bin hoppers. Okay, so during harvest this year, a couple fields kind of stuck out to us for having some rock issues. So this year we were going to pick LC20, ALO1 along with the peas and hopefully get those fields cleaned up a bit better for next year's. Uh, I'll take any questions at this time now. In the front. Okay, so the question is, uh, some of the forage studies have been proven really good to help with salinity. Um, have there's been any studies done with tiling to help with salinity? Am I correct with your question? Okay, perfect. I'll answer this question. Um, we, cur we did not look at that option uh, here at the college, um, but I have heard of studies, didn't really hear how they went. Um, from what I know, and we've done it on our farm, and it didn't work exactly the best as we thought it was going to. Um, it kind of, yeah, it kind of crapped the bed a little bit, so, yeah. Any other questions? Perfect, thank you. And up next is wheat. Good afternoon, everyone. We are the Wheat Team. My name is Jana Trenchuk. I'm from Smoky Lake, Alberta, and I am this year's Analysis Manager. I'm Skylar Pike. I'm from Maidstone, Saskatchewan, and I was part of the Finance Team. My name is Zane Pipke from West Lock, Alberta, and I was part of the Marketing Team. My name is Prince Patel. I am from Gujarat, India. This year, I was the part of Crop Demo. My name is Nathaniel Cordes. I'm from New Norway, Alberta, and I was part of the Production Team. So for 2022-2023, our harvest, we had three wheat fields that we harvested. These fields were AL01, LC25, and LC26C. All three of these fields were the same variety, and that was AAC Brandon. That gave us a, th a total of 309 acres of wheat that we harvested this year. So if you look at this map, it shows where our fields are, where that we harvested wheat on. The red arrows point to those fields. We are currently at this blue star on the left side or the right side for you guys of the map. All of the fields that we harvested were just west of the college. AL01 being the closest about a mile west of the college, down College Drive. LC25 and 26 
are about five miles down west of College Drive again, so it's a bit farther, but. So for seeding and fertility, all three fields, since they were the same variety, had the exact same seeding rate of 132 pounds per acre. This was determined by uh, our germination, our thousand kernel weight, our mortality, and our plants per square foot, which we targeted 30 of. Our seed treatment was Raxel Pro for all three fields, and our fertility for ALO1 was 70, 15, 5, where our fertility for LC25 and 26 was 60, 30, 10. This is where P and K was seed placed and nitrogen was side banded. So for our pesticides for 2022-2023, we did a Paradigm Pre plus uh, glyphosate for our pre-seed. Um, in crop, we did a Rexade pass. Our fungicide was Mirvis Ace, and our pre-harvest was a glyphosate application for perennial weed control on ALO1. Um, LC25 and 26 did not need this uh, need a glyphosate application for perennial weed control for pre-harvest because there were no perennial weeds on this field at the time. Also, it didn't need a desiccant for dry down like heat because the field was very mature as fall was hot, dry, and the maturity was even throughout the field. So harvest for last year's crop came early and it was also a dry harvest. On ALO1, we had that field combined by September 14th and LC25 and 26C, we had combined by September 26. As I stated, all the grain came off at a safe moisture content for storage, so it went directly into bins and we did not have to dry any of it. A few of the challenges that we faced uh, for wheat harvest last fall was a lot of lodging on AL01. A lot of the low places in that field were lodged due to heavier rains later in the growing season, as well as a heavier crop. So it was quite a challenge to pick the crop up here with the straight cut header since we had not swapped the crop. Also rocks were an issue on that same field which made it even more challenging to pick up the crop because when we had put the header low enough to pick up the lodge crop we were running the risk of picking up rocks. Bin storage was also very limited last fall on the farm here. That is because the college does not have enough bin storage for all the seeded acres when yields are average or above average. So last fall we thought for sure that we'd have to be piling wheat on the ground. However, we were able to fit all of it into bins in the end and that is because a field of malt barley that the college grew ended up going for green feed instead of malt because it got lodged later in the growing season due to heavy rains. So the bins that we would have used for the malt we were able to put wheat into. We were not able to put wheat into any air bins though, as we were saving those bins for canola and flax. However, the wheat was dry and we monitored it closely. So about half of our storage we stored at the bar farm in the bins there, which is located by the Lakeland College Research Center. And the rest of the storage was here on the campus bin yard for a total production of just over 24,000 bushels. Continuing on with wheat harvest for the 22-23 crop year, our average moisture contents when the wheat came off the field, on ALO1 we averaged 11.7% and on LC25 and 26C we averaged 13.4%. After harvest was completed, both fields received spot tillage with a high speed disc. That was mostly for residue management to clean up the fields a bit for this coming um, spring for seeding so the drill can get through okay. Um, we also wanted to clean up some of the lodged areas in ALO1. And then there was a few compacted areas in that same field, especially towards the north end of the field as well as the southeast corner, just due to a lot of equipment traffic in those areas. Um, bales, straw bales also came off of both those fields. So ALO1, we only baled a section of that and we got 50 square bales off that field. And then on LC25 and 26C, we baled that as well and we got 178 bales. The bales went to the livestock student managed farm at the college here. So these are our average wheat yields from the 22-23 crop year. At Lakeland College, we averaged 78 bushels per acre on Brandon wheat. 
compared to other producers within a 120 mile radius who average 61 bushels per acre. This average is both the fields combined and on AL01 we average lower at 70 bushels per acre and on LC25 and 26C we averaged 84 bushels an acre. The reason for the lower yield on AL01 is because that field is a highly variable field in terms of soil quality and topography. So on that field we have a lot of really sandy hills where the crop gets scorched as well as the thin is just the stand is thinner there. And then in the low areas, it's very saline, so the crop does not establish well there either. And then in addition, we had a lot of lodging on that field, which brought our yields down. So this year, when we got to the college in the fall, these are the pre-made contracts from last year's SMF marketing team. They did 90 metric tons pre-contracted, starting off at 11.25 per bushel. Uh, again into 1275 and finally hitting their 1350 for all October delivery. This has all helped with our bin storage uh, as it was able to get hauled off sooner than later. Uh, this is the contract of grain that our marketing team did this year. On October 27th, we set a target for 1275. That day when we set the target, it was at $12 per bushel. Uh, we only did 50 metric ton, little gun shy at the start of the year. We're anticipating the markets to go higher. Five days later, our target got hit. We were super happy with that as that was the best price we ended up getting this year. Uh, that was for November delivery. Uh, later on, we anticipated uh, higher uh, futures, but we didn't see that. But the basis narrowed in, giving us the opportunity to do a basis only contract. We did a positive 263 basis off the May mini wheat futures. We have until April 21st to deliver this, or to set the futures. Uh, this is delivered in February. Since with the basis only contract, you're allowed to uh, haul in the grain and price your futures later. Uh, once we're done hauling in the 350 metric ton, there's 15.4 metric ton left in the bottom of flat bottom bin. We had the grain vac set up, it was a nice day. Decided to haul in the rest of that wheat for cash price, which was 1172. Uh, a little good news today, we've seen a little rally in the wheat futures, decided to uh, sell the last 60 metric ton for 1141 today. Also, we priced 100 metric ton of uh, our basis contract for 1122, and we have a target in also on the basis, 250 metric ton for 1150. We're gonna let that ride, and we anticipate the markets to keep rising. Uh, Uh, on the, this is a graph from bar chart. You see that first star there on the far left? Uh, that's October 31st. That's when our 1275 uh, target got picked up. Later on in the year, closer to Christmas time, uh, decided to go lower, uh, fluctuating in between those range bound. Uh, the wheat market this year is very volatile as uh, uncertainties across seas. That second uh, red star there around January 23rd, that's when we locked in our basis only contract. Uh, not, not long after, end of February, the markets uh, fell off a cliff. Uh, we talked to different grain buyers in, local, in the local area. Uh, we all anticipated uh, not that much of a drop. Uh, unfortunately, we've seen that. Uh, you can see here around March 6th, uh, hopefully that's a new resistant line. Uh, we are anticipating it to keep climbing from that. Uh, but all the local grain buyers are unsure and uncertain of what could happen here in the next little while, but we are still uh, anticipating a higher price for our rest of the basis only contract. So our input costs for 22-23, our pesticides were $66 per acre, our fertilizer was $127 per acre, and our seed and seed treatment was $53 per acre. So our total costs, our inputs were $246 per acre, our custom was at $30 per acre, our equipment and repairs was at $28 per acre, our insurance was at $24 per acre, and our comparative farming costs was at $160 per acre. Our comparative farming costs are the costs that we don't see as SMF, but you would see on a normal farming operation. This includes the cost of taxes, utilities, and the purchase of equipment. So finance from the last year, total, Income is uh, $690, and 
about expenses is $487 per acre and total net margin we got $203 per acre. Uh, last year break even 79.3 bushel per acre and we needed $6.22 for break even. So up for wheat field for upcoming year LC26A, LC18, LC45. So total is 221 acre. So we are all at right now at a blue star. LC26A is just five miles west of the campus. And LC18 is just west down on College Drive Road. And LC45 is just south man. So where that is for 2023 and 24, ASC Brandon, uh, semi dwarf good disease package. That means uh, susceptible to common bunt and low loading score. ASC Brandon is for only LC 26A and LC 45. ASC Oakley, we can say that new Brandon, semi dwarf great disease package. Like uh, that means. Uh, Good tolerance with the physiram head blight and very low loading score. Okay, so as you just heard, we have two different uh, wheat varieties this year. This being AAC brand or AAC Hockley and AAC Brandon. So Hockley is considered like the new Brandon. It is a newer variety, just came out, and it's hopefully going to replace Brandon. So we're using our own Brandon seed from last year as we have some that we're able to use. Our Hockley seed is coming from a local retailer. Um, all of these uh, wheat seed is going to be treated with Raxil Pro, uh, though our seeding rates are going to differ between the two varieties. Uh, AAC Hockley has 125 pounds per acre seeding rate. This is because the germination's 99%. We did a mortality of 10%, 1,000 kernel weight, and our target plants per square foot, which we targeted 30. Uh, then for the Brandon, we did very similar, though the germination was 98%. We're targeting 30 plants again still. Our mortality was 10% and our 1,000 kernel weight are what we took into consideration. For our fertility, on LC18, we did an 88, 15, 10. On LC45, we did a 95, 0, 0. LC26A, we did 125.15. That's where the P and K is seed placed. The N is side banded. Um, the reason that LC45 has no P or K being placed is because that, uh, that field was very he heavily manured. Therefore, no P or K is needed as there's already excess amounts, almost toxic amounts on that field. For our pesticide plan for the upcoming year, we're gonna do a, a pre-seed burn off of pre-pass flex on all fields, though we're also going to do a tillage pass first on LC45. This is because last year it was corn and we need to break up the large stalks and the large root system of corn so we can direct seed into it so we don't have any pat or misses um, seeding. Uh, we're going to do an in-crop pass of Rexade on all three, or the first two fields, sorry. And on LC26A, we're doing an Axial Extreme IPAC. This is because this is a group one product. Uh, the Axial is to control the wild oats. And last year, there was peas in that field, and it was Viper. And that's a group two. Therefore, we wanted to switch up our mode of action, our group there. And we're never worried about needing to apply a group one product onto barley, because that's a research field, and it always gets changed from peas, wheat, canola. It's a three-year rotation there, so we're never going to have that problem. Um, for our uh, fungicide, we're going to be using Miravis Ace if it's needed. It also always depends on what diseases you have present in the field, so it comes to scouting time what you need to use. Though for our pre-harvest, we're also going to use a glyphosate pre-harvest for perennial weed control if needed. Again, if a proper desiccant's needed, like heat, we can also use that too. These are expected yields that we've set for the 23-24 crop year. So on LC18, which is going to be seeded to the new Hockley variety, we're expecting 70 bushels per acre. And on LC45, which will be seeded to Brandon, we're expecting 65 bushels per acre. And lastly, on LC26A, also Brandon, we're expecting 70 bushels an acre. This will bring us to our expected production of around 15,000 bushels. 
We have set a lower target yield on LC45, and that is because that field is highly compacted and just less productive. So our pre-made contracts this year going into uh, next year's harvest, we decided to do a pacer contract with 100 metric tons, which works out to 3,674 bushels. Uh, this price period is going to be from April 24th to July 26th, uh, off the December mini wheat futures. Uh, this will be hauled in, in September to help with bin storage, uh, since that's an issue on the college. We decided to pick this time period because uh, that's when seeding is, dry in the summer. We could see some really high rallies, uh, hoping, anticipating that the markets to rise and we catch uh, top value. The market outlook for wheat last year was affected by Canadian production. So in 2022, we saw wheat production across the prairies rise by just over 50% from the previous year. That is because growing conditions were a lot better last year with more timely rains and harvesting conditions were also better. So that led to more supply and uh, the prices for wheat fell. Global production last year was also up and it came in at a record total of over 780 million metric tons. It is expected to continue increasing in certain parts of the world, such as the US. However, in other parts of the world, such, such as Argentina, it is expected to decline. Currently, demand for Canadian wheat is up slightly because harvest reports from the US wheat crop from last year indicate uh, poor wheat quality and production. Spring seeding in the Ukraine is also looking favorable, which has um, also contributed to the market declining a bit, as well as the winter in Europe has been more mild for their winter wheat seeded there. Conflict in Russia and Ukraine created a lot of volatility and threatened global supply over last year, and it continues to play a factor into the wheat market. This is because Russia and Ukraine are two of the world's largest wheat producing and exporting countries. So Russian invasion into the Ukraine disrupted the farming cycle there, and, there, and Russian intervention in exports from the Ukraine threatened global supply, which led to spikes in the market. The US and China also play a role in the wheat market. So last year, imports to China of wheat from the US were up. That is because China is currently not able to meet their domestic demand, even though they are the world's largest wheat producing country. Lastly, the India wheat export ban was imposed by India trying to stabilize their domestic market and their internal wheat prices. They're not a major wheat exporting country, so it hasn't been continuing to affect the market. However, when they did impose it, it led to a slight spike in the market. So our projected finances, oh, sorry, inputs for 23-24, our seed and seed treatment at $33 per acre, our fertilizer at $120 per acre, and our pesticides at $70 per acre. Our projected total for 23-24, our inputs at $223 per acre, our custom at $30 per acre, our equipment and repairs at $50 per acre, our insurance at $25 per acre, and our comparative farming costs at $160 per acre. So our projected finances for 23-24, our projected income is $700 per acre, which comes to a total of $155,000. Our expected expenses are $488 per acre, which comes to a total of $108,000. And our projected net, mar net margin comes to $212 per acre, which comes to a total of $47,000. Our projected break-evens for 23-24. If we get our expected price, we need 49 bushels per acre. And if we get our expected yield, we need $6.96 per bushel. Now I'd like to open it up to the audience if you guys have any questions for us. Yes. I'm just wondering if uh, for the upcoming year, I haven't looked at any ridge forecast maps lately, but if you guys, with the elimination of boar in that, if you guys uh, have a plan to meet, if you do have a ridge outbreak on your branded field? 
okay. So the question was, he hasn't looked at the midge maps this year. Um, do we have a plan B if we do get midge because our Hockley and our Brandon uh, varieties are not midge tolerant this year? Um, so I will answer that question. Yes, kind of. We have, so because neither of them, we, plant, we chose to plant non-midge tolerant wheat because we looked at uh, the maps, the midge, uh, midge maps, and we are not in the hot zone. So we deemed that we were safe, though if, uh, if not, then we'll have to find an insecticide to use. Any other questions? Top. This is from online. Okay. Congratulations on the wheat yield. What do you attribute to the fact that your yield is higher than others in the area? Okay, so the question was, uh, congrats on our wheat yield, and how did we find out, or like, why is our wheat, or wheat yield higher than others in the area? And I'll pass that over to Jana. So our wheat yield is what it is. Um, when we uh, set our targets and stuff, we use what, um, like our seeding rate, our seeding um, plants per square foot, thousand seed weight and fertility blends that have been used on the college before and that we um, all go through, they go through the committee, committee committees. And um, other um, producers in the area, all those averages go into um, a data platform system called Farm Command. So the, like, they're for a wide radius. So that could also um, contribute to that average being a little bit lower because people who had lower yields further away from us, say they were in an area where it wasn't as good as of growing conditions, would play into that average and bring it down somewhat. So I'm not sure if you want to add anything for today. Uh, I will add to that. You also gotta remember that like farm command, when we find the average yield for producers over 120 mile radius, that's only as good as how good proactive farmers are. If they're not like having their yield goals set right, they're not getting the proper yields from their combine, all that data is actually skewed. Any other questions? Okay, so that I get this question right. So you were talking about putting potash with our fertility blends to increase standability, and then if that doesn't help, also applying a manipulator or something to help the standability of our crop. Have we thought about that? That's the question. Awesome, I will answer that one again. So yeah, we, when we went through our fertility, we tried to look at when we can add phosphorus to help the standability of our crop. Like on four or five, we did not because it was so high and it's actually almost in the toxic level. And the last four years, that uh, piece have been, has been the corn, so we don't know how it's gonna do in wheat. That's why we also have a lower yield goal in that field. Um, we are doing a trial where you will learn later on in the presentation that we are gonna do, uh, I forget what the product's called, but it is a growth regulator on one of our crops. So it's gonna be a trial, but we have not totally discussed that to do it a full field scale. That answer your question? Awesome. Any other questions? Yes. So the question was, there are a lot of elevators very close to us. Have we done calculations to see what the price, the cost is for us to actually put it in the bin, take it out, burn all the extra fuel, the time, um, instead of just hauling it straight to the elevator off of combine? And I'm gonna pass this question to Zayden. 
Uh, so I have not looked at the financials of it, but uh, always, well, most times, the markets are always lower in the fall time with the lower basis because the elevators would not like the grain. Uh, like, like you see now in March, we have a positive basis where in the fall time we did not. Uh, also to help with uh, maybe lead off the finances, uh, for more marketing, if you sell your grain in the fall, you don't get the chance to, uh, like today we ended up selling grain two hours before this and playing the markets and using different tools as targets and pacers uh, and different learning strategies throughout the team instead of just selling off the combine for cash price. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Up next, Canola. All right, hello everyone, we're the uh, Canola team. I'm Ashley Hansen. I was the manager of Mixed Farm this year, and I'm from St. Walbert, Saskatchewan. I'm Marcy LeBlanc, I'm from Estevan, Saskatchewan, and I'm the production manager. Uh, my name's Kyle Holman, I'm from Macklin, Saskatchewan, and I was on the analysis team. I'm Corey Holman, I'm also from Macklin, Saskatchewan, and I was on the finance team. My name's Braden Ostafee, I'm from York and Saskatchewan, and I am a part of the marketing team. My name is Promise Adhikari. I'm from Nepal and I'm on Crop Demo Team. Okay, so to jump into canola, this was just a good visual representation for you all of where our canola fields were when we came back to college to harvest this year. So on LC26B, LC18, and LC17, we had three different canola fields. So LC17 was a DeKalb Roundup Ready variety, 482. We had two different seed treatments on that field this year. They chose to go with last year a Buteo Start and a Lumiderm. Now the reason they used two is because they put the Buteo Start on the exterior of the field or like your headlands because it's a um, more prominent flea beetle product. Uh, flea beetles are going to overwinter in your field edges and come in full force into your headlands. So that was kind of their thought there. Lumiderm does have some help. Um, benefits to your flea beetle issues, but mostly a cutworm product, so they thought to put that in the interior would be best. In theory, that should have worked really well. Luckily, we didn't have a huge flea beetle pressure to deal with this year, so that's kind of how that one worked out. LC18, we had a specialty Cargill Crush canola that year. this year. Um, it was treated with a Buteo starch as well. And then LC26B, we had our Cantera CS4000, which was a Liberty Link variety. That was on the college's research field. Um, so it was just treated with a base seed treatment, which they chose as a Helix Vibrance. So for our pesticides this last growing season, uh, all the fields got a pre-seed burn of Prospect Glyphosate Mix. Uh, for our in-crop weed control, uh, LC17 seen an application of Eclipse XC, LC18 seen an application of glyphosate, and 26B got an application of Liberty. Um, LC20, LC17 and 18 also got an application of Proline fungicide. This was a preventative against sclerotinia, and LC26B we found did not need that preventative measure. Our fertility for the last growing season, LC17 and 18 both got a fertility blend of 8015015, while 26B got an application of 9530020. Uh, these were both based off of uh, soil samples taken from their respective fields. Our nitrogen and sulfur were both side banded, and our phosphorus was seed placed. Uh, our canola harvest started on September 29th. Uh, the canola was not uh, swathed because we don't have a we didn't have a swather and uh, there was concerns about uh, locking in uh, green seed. It was not sprayed because there was concerns about the desiccant uh, penetrating the uh, canopy. 
For storage, we had to keep the specialty canola uh, stored separately from the other varieties to ensure the uh, dollar premium on it. The specialty was stored in the air bin and monitored with storage max cables, and the other canola was in flat bins, also monitored with storage max cables. Our Liberty Link canola yielded 51 bushels an acre, our specialty yielded 44 bushels an acre, and our Roundup Ready yielded 60 bushels an acre, compared to the area averages of 42 for the Roundup Ready, 43 for the specialty, and 55 for the Liberty Link. Uh, we got these numbers from re retail stores we bought our seed from. For our canola contracts this past growing season, uh, this is a chart off of bar chart representing our current, current futures month. Uh, Last year's marketing team sold some regular canola at $19.20. They also uh, forward contract some Victory canola for $23.14. Uh, this year's marketing team, uh, Cargill was offering a premium, so we took advantage and sold some for $19.50. And then the market started to drop, so what we did was we sold some, but we attached a call option to it. Uh, for $17.73. We also have two basis contracts uh, open, uh, one for $1.49 and one for $1.30. Uh, it's important to note that our dollar premium for our Victory Canola is included in these prices. Some market influences that we were watching over uh, this marketing year, uh, typically around that May-June time frame, we see historically the price increases. Uh, usually it's from spring weather rallies. Uh, we also monitor uh, soybean production. Uh, canola uh, follows closely to soybean production. If we see uh, soybean oil increase, then typically the next day canola will do the same. We also monitor uh, production in other countries. We were a little worried that uh, Ukraine w wouldn't get all their seeded acres in this year. However, uh, it is looking pretty promising for them this spring. And we also watch uh, biodiesel production. If, if someone's going to announce that there's going to be more biodiesel produced in the future, uh, that means we're going to crush more canola and the price will increase as well. So here is our 2022 input cost. On LC26B Liberty Link variety of canola, seed and seed treatment cost was $58 per acre. For fertilizer, $167 per acre, and for pesticides, it was $65 per acre. For LC18 specialty variety of canola, seed and seed treatment cost was $89 per acre, fertilizer was $130 per acre, and pesticides was $59 per acre. And for LC17 Roundup Ready variety of canola, seed and seed treatment cost was $74 per acre, Fertilizer was $130 per acre, and pesticide was $38 per acre. So as you can see on the Liberty, the fertilizer is a little bit higher, and that's because we soil test to determine our rates, and we felt that that field needed a little bit more. So to best compare these two, we should look at the seed and seed treatment and pesticide costs. So for the Liberty, that brings the total to $123, compared to the Roundups only being at $111, and the specialty canola being at $148. Here are our total costs for this year. Uh, total cost came out to $523, of which $270 was for inputs, $25 for custom, $42 for insurance, $27 for equipment and repairs, and $160 again for the comparative farming costs. Here's our income for the 2022-2023 crop year. Income was $833, while expenses were $523, and the net margin was 309. Our break evens at our yields that we got this year, the Roundup Ready needed $8.83 a bushel, while the Liberty needed $10.36, and the specialty needed $12. Okay, so now jumping into our 2023-2024 field year, we have four different fields going into canola this year. Um, so in our research plots, just moved over one this year to LC26C. Then LC19, 14, and LC20 are going to be our other three. LC20 is just located three miles south of the college on Highway 41. 
So LC1419 and 2060 are going into a brand new variety called Optimum Gly P510G by Cartevin Pioneer. We are super excited to be trying out this variety as it offers a Gen 3 clubroot resistance. Um, there is not clubroot currently confirmed on the college's field, but there is clubroot in the area, so we wanted to be as proactive as we possibly could be. Uh, a little bit of a brief kind of explanation on clubroot. So we had clubroot, we found a resistant gene, we kept growing club root, it mutated through that generation one. Um, then they found a generation two resistant line, we kept growing canola, it mutated again, and it has actually reached through that generation two um, resistant. Currently right now, Dr. Shelkov at the U of A hasn't found anything that has been able to reach through the gen three, so that's kind of why we're really excited to have it on there. Um, and we're gonna have a seed treatment on there of Lumiderm. And then on LC20, we're gonna be doing our Liberty Link on there. Uh, 343, and it's going to be a buteo start seed treatment. It's the first time BASF has actually offered buteo on their seed, so we're super excited to give that a, a try this year. So our pesticide plans for this upcoming year will see all fields get a pre-burn of Conquer 2 and glyphosate mix. After that, our in-crop uh, weed control will see uh, all of our Roundup Ready varieties get an application of Eclipse XC, while our Liberty on LC20 will get an application of Liberty Centurion with an, an Amigo adjuvant. The fungicide for all the fields will be Proline Gold. Once again, this is for a, as a preventative against sclerotinia. Um, our pre-harvest, we plan on swathing the Roundup Ready varieties with the Liberty once again getting uh, glyphosate heat desiccant. The glyphosate will be used as uh, control for the perennial weeds in the field and the heat will be a dry down desiccant. These plans are subject to change as the uh, agro agronomists and ourselves scout the fields and identify different weed pressures throughout the growing season. The fertility plan for the college this year, it's gonna look a bit new. Uh, we're gonna try some variable rate this year. We're quite excited about that. Uh, each field will be getting its own uh, blend LC14 will be getting a blend of 75, 10, 0, 12. LC19 will be getting a blend of 80, 15, 0, 15. LC20 will be getting a blend of 90, 25, 0, 15. And LC26C will be getting 105, 25, 0, 15. Uh, once again, our nitrogen and sulfur will be side banded while our phosphorus is seed placed. So here is our 2023 projected yield. On LC14, LC19, and LC26C, there will be Roundup Ready variety of canola, and the yield expectation is 55 bushels per acre. On LC20, Liberty Link variety, the yield expectation is 45 bushels per acre. The lower yield expectation on LC20 is that the seed bed is not good. It has too much manure on it, and we are working towards making a better seed bed. Uh, to look in the future of marketing canola, we have to look at how much uh, new total crush we're going to be seeing, probably around in the next five years. Uh, Viterra and Cargill outside of Regina are building two of the biggest crush plants in Canada. Uh, Richardson in Yorkton is doubling their capacity to 2.2 million metric tons of canola. So if we add them all up, we get a total of 7.9 million metric tons that we're going to be adding to crush to the future. So just to put this number in perspective for you guys, on the past three years in Canada, we grow an average of 21 million metric tons, of which we already crush 9.5 million metric tons, and we export 10 million metric tons. If we also take away the amount that we're gonna be crushing in the future, we will be short 6.4 million metric tons of canola. Uh, this since we're crushing more within Canada, there will be less canola to export to other countries. So other countries are gonna to want to pay more, increasing our futures price. And not only that, with more local demand within Canada, we will also see our basis increase. For new crop canola, uh, we had anticipated the mark, we were anticipating the market to go up. So we were waiting to do a put option. Uh, However, the market fell off a cliff and we did not get that opportunity. But what we did do was we set a PACER contract uh, running from May 1st to 
uh, August 16th, uh, hopefully capturing the spring weather rallies and potentially the early fall frost. Uh, we did this on 84 metric tons of canola. So here is our projected 2023 input cost. For a round of ready variety, seed and seed treatment cost is expected to be $75 per acre, pesticides $40 per acre, and fertilizer $140 per acre. And for libertilling variety, seed and seed treatment cost is expected to be $60 per acre, pesticides $70 per acre, and fertilizer $140 per acre. So yeah, the total projected cost for the Roundup Ready is gonna be $550 this year, of which 255 is for inputs, 40 bucks for custom work, $45 for insurance, 50 again for equipment and repairs, and 160 for the comparative farming costs. The Liberty is a little bit less at 540, uh, with 270 being for inputs, 15 for custom work, 45 for insurance, 50 again for equipment and repairs, and 160 for the comparative farming costs. So our total income for the 2023 year, we expect to be right around $757, while our expenses will be 371 for a net margin of 386. At our expected break even yield of 50 bushels per acre, uh, we need $7.50, and at the current futures price of $15, we need to get 25 bushels per acre to break even. Thank you for listening. I'd now like to open the audience for any questions. Up top. Online again. Why have you decided to change the pre seed herbicide from Prospect in 2022 to Conquer Two in 2023 for your control field? So the question was why did we choose to change our herbicide from Prospect to Conquer? And I'll give this question to Ashley. So the change from Prospect to Conquer came as um, the fields that we're seeding to canola were previously barley. And our barley, as was said, had some lodging issues as well as a couple of the barley silage fields have quite a bit of regrowth. Because of that, we're kind of worried about some weed pressures there, which is why we picked the Conquer 2 and glyphosate mix. Uh, it, should smoke out what we need it to kill on the field to give us a nice clean field to seed our canola into. Yep. Yes, I've got a question for manager tonight, by the way. Um, congrats on the excellent uh, crop results you gave in the canola. And, uh, and also keeping your costs flat year over year, a lot of us farmers are white knuckled uh, going to this year with higher costs. Obviously, it gives us manage some of those costs fixed. So the question was, with the rising cost of canola seed in particular, uh, do we see any opportunity or have we looked at using a corn planter and, and does that limit uh, our fertility plan? Yeah, you bet. So as a college, no, we haven't really looked into using a planter um, yet. We just got a new drill this year, so we're super excited to have a, a little bit of a better spread. Um, but to further that question, I think that Mason might have a better answer. So we'll <laughs> see what he comes up with. Um, previous in the past, um, our farm, I'm from Peace River, and we actually used a horse planter to seed all of our canola. And we had uh, some issues with the planter itself but uh, they ended up actually driving up the cost of the seed for the planter. Due to the knockout wheel, you need a really precise seed size. And to get such a pr uh, precise seed size, they ended up uh, charging more and more to get such a precise seed size. So the cost per acre of seed during our first years, we were at about 50% the cost of our air drill, which made it very profitable to use the planter. 
And then in the end, three years later, the price for planter seed is actually the same per acre as air seeder, even though you're at half rate. So um, going at instead of two pounds an acre, and now you're at five with an air seeder for the same price, it's better to have that extra couple pounds an acre in case you have any uh, issues with flea beetles, for an example. Um, does that answer your question? Yep. yep. Just wondering, I'm sure all the farmers are wondering as well with the uh, volatility in the corona market. Um, the one sold bushel is gone from bushel to the bins. Just wondering about your call option last couple of years, the market's rallied and your call option probably is worth a little more money uh, today. But just wondering how you, um, as your group, decided to place it. So the question was, uh, uh, what was our theory to putting, attaching a call option to our contract that we had made? Um, I, okay, I'll give you the long answer to this story, uh, to this question. Um, I'll take you back to the day we set up the contract. Uh, we had just finished seeing uh, the canola price fall off about $20 a metric ton every day. So we got together as a marketing group and we had to decide, okay, well, like what's happening to our markets? We looked, is it a fundamental issue? Uh, we looked, it probably wasn't. It, there, we didn't seem to find any problems with supply and demand. So it had to be a technical issue we were looking. It probably, it could be a outside influence, something like the banks, that Silicon Valley bank going bankrupt in the States, uh, which was affecting our market. So. Uh, we anticipated the market to be oversold and we'll see a, a bounce back, like a positive bounce back in the market. But we weren't entirely sure our th theory was right. So what we did was we sold some canola at spot price, pr creating a price floor, preventing, any, preventing our price from dropping anymore. And then we attached a call option and a call option will pay you as the market goes up. So if we see any upside potential in the market, then we would capture that off of our call option. Are there any other questions? Thank you. Up next will be corn and barley. Okay, good afternoon everyone. Uh, we're gonna talk to you about corn and barley today. My name is Colby Wignes, I'm from Viscount, Saskatchewan, and I was a part of the mixed farm team this year. I'm Ashton Form, I'm from Paradise Hill, Saskatchewan, and I was this year's special projects manager. I'm Alex Colton, I'm from Concert, Alberta, and I was this year's finance manager. Okay, so beginning with uh, our corn silage production from 22-23, we had corn silage on two fields this year, them being LC45, which is the piece straight south of the college, and the north half of LC13, which is the north half of the field straight east of the college. That accounted to a total of 124 seeded acres. They were both seeded on the 12th of May, and they were both seeded to a Pioneer 6909R variety. As far as fertility, we went with a straight 8000 nitrogen blend that was broadcast and tilled into the field. This blend was split up into a 75-25 ESN or urea ESN mix because ESN uh, ESN is coated, so it expels its nitrogen slower, giving the seed more nitrogen throughout the growing cycle. Uh, both. Fields received a glyphosate application on the 7th of June, and LC13 also got a special Bayer research application done at the same time. 
Uh, the corn silage was taken off between August 31st and September 2nd. They both averaged around 10.8 metric ton an acre, which is slightly below average, which is around 12 to 14. Uh, well, we still ended up with around 1,300 ton of corn come off this year. So our input costs for corn silage this year uh, ended up being about 130 for fertilizer, 34 for pesticide, and 94 for seed and seed treatment. Our fertilizer is uh, definitely the biggest impact for our corn silage, just given how aggressive of a nitrogen user the corn plants are. For our uh, overall corn silage costs, they're very similar to all the other commodities, um, only difference, of course, being our inputs and our custom expense. Our custom expense is significantly higher due to the fact that we hire a corn planter. Um, so uh, for all of our other commodities, we go in and seed it ourselves, uh, and that's what um, that hiked up custom expense is for. Okay, now moving on to our barley silage this year. Uh, again, it was on two fields one of them being LC14 and the other, half, other one being LC13, the south half of that field. So uh, they were seeded between May 14th and 15th. There was a total of 168 acres of barley silage planted and uh, the variety for both was a CDC Austinson. As far as fertility goes, uh, based on our soil data, we determined that a 52-10-15 blend was best for LC13 while the 61 15 10 blend was best for LC14. Uh, all of our barley, being silage and malt, got these same uh, herbicide applications this year, that being a Paradigm glyphosate preseed, a Resivant MCPA in-crop, and a Miravis Neo fungicide. Uh, they were both silaged on the same day, July 28th. They averaged around the same uh, yield as well. LC14 doing very slightly better than LC13, though. So for our barley silage input cost, uh, biggest difference compared to our corn is going to be uh, our fertilizer um, coming in at a lot less, and that's, again, due to um, the nitrogen usage of barley being significantly lower. For our overall barley silage costs, they are uh, lower than corn, although there is a lower yield on our barley silage. Uh, and again, that custom expense is about half, uh, just due to the fact that we don't pay for a planter for our barley silage. Okay, so now our malt barley this year, it was on LC19. There was a total of 93 acres of it seeded this year. Uh, it was seeded on the 13th of May, and it went into an AAC Synergy variety. Again, it got the same pesticide applications as the silage barley, being a paradigm glyphosate pre-seed in crop of a resivant and MCPA and a fungicide of Maribus Neo. The fertility for LC19 was a 46-15-15 blend. It was again based on our soil data that we had from previous years. So now LC14 and LC19 came into some weather related problems at the time of silaging. Uh, LC14, there was a rain delay because it rained the day after they started silaging. And by the time everything had dried out and equipment went back out, it was the, the crop itself was too dry and it was also fairly lodged due to the heavy rainfall. So they decided to cut it and green feed it and, and bale it for green feed instead. LC19 had a very similar problem. It got hit with about four inches of rain and it caused it to lay very flat. So they had some concerns over varying maturity as well as the problems that flat barley may cause from uh, while silaging. So they again decided to cut it and green feed bale it. So the bales that we took off this year, LC14 had 202 bales and LC19 got 348 bales off coming to a total of 550 green feed bales this year. So for our green feed inputs, um, these were originally planned to be uh, malt barley inputs. So um, although our fertilizer is higher than our silage, um, the overall fertility on that field would have been lower based off of uh, soil tests so that um, it didn't have too high of protein and would have made malt, um, assuming it didn't lodge as it did. Um, our seed uh, cost is significantly lower because we took barley that we had last year, cleaned it, got it seed treated as opposed to buying new uh, seed. 
For our overall green feed cost, uh, again, the biggest factor is our inputs um, and the uh, custom expenses being at 25 compared to um, our corn for the same reason we don't pay for a custom planter. And the remaining cost of that custom expenses for all of the other groups as well is actually our custom sprayer that comes in uh, and does our spraying for us since we do not own a sprayer on the college. A bit of background about the uh, fact that the SMF crops grows the feed for Lakeland College but doesn't actually use it. Uh, how this ends up working is we will produce the silage and um, other feed based on what the SMF uh, livestock units are uh, kind of wanting as well as what our, makes sense for our plans. We will then turn around and sell this to a central system within the college called um, originally central feed and then we don't actually produce enough silage and feed for all of the different livestock units. Um, because of this central feed will turn around and buy feed from external vendors um, and then with uh, all of uh, the feed management, they'll turn around and sell it to the different uh, SMF livestock units, be it commercial, dairy, uh, equine, as well as the others. So to now go on to next year's growing season, our silage fields for 2023 and 24. Corn silage will be located on AL01, which is 135 acres, as well as the north half of LC13 again. And barley silage will be located on LC12. So our corn silage this year, we actually are going with three different varieties. AL01, which is 135 acres, will be seeded to Pioneer 6909R, which has been previously used on the college for a couple of years now. LC13, which is a total of 40 acres, 20 of those acres will be seeded to Pioneer 7202, and the other 20 acres will be seeded to Pride Seeds 1017. Our planting plan, so as mentioned before, we hire a custom planter that costs us $34 per acre. And then all fields are pro-tilled pre-seed and rolled post-seeding, and that is at a rent of $5 per acre. For our target seed rate, it's about 36,000 seeds per acre or two and a half acres per bag. Our fertility, um, all fertility for corn will be floated on and then incorporated when the field is pro-tilled. The pro-till will actually be on the field almost immediately after it's floated, so we don't have any concerns with losses. Um, for AL01, the blend will be 115, 20, 10. 29 of those pounds, which is 25% of the urea, will be ESN. And on LC13, it is strictly going to be 105 pounds per acre of nitrogen. 20 of those pounds, which is also 25% of your urea, will be ESN. Our pesticide plan, so for both AL01 and LC13, all pesticides will be the same. Uh, seed treatment of Lumigen by Lumivia and a pre-seed will be not applicable as we will be tilling before. In crop will be glyphosate, sortan, IS, tank mixed, and fungicide, if needed, will be Trivapro. This is to help with things like northern leaf blight, any leaf rust, gray spot, and eye spot. Our expected yields for all three um, varieties will be 14 tons per acre. So for our projected corn silage input costs, we have about 40 bucks for pesticides, uh, fertilizer at 140, again being significantly higher than barley due to that uh, heavy nitrogen usage, and about $100 for seed and seed treatment. For our overall uh, projected corn silage costs, um, we have our $280 for our inputs, our custom at $60, again higher due to that custom planter, uh, insurance at 35, equipment repairs 50, and then our comparative farming at 160. So on to barley silage now. As mentioned before, it'll be located on LC12, which is 117 acres total. It'll be seeded to CDC Austinson, and with a target population of 30 plants per foot squared, and a yield goal of 10 tons per acre. Our fertility plan, which is based off of fall soil samples and yield goals that are set, will be a 60-20-15 blend. And our pesticides, our seed treatment will be Raxel Pro, a pre-seed of Prepass XC. Prepass has two to three weeks of residual effects, so that's going to help with any volunteer canola that might pop up in those first two to three weeks, as the field was previously canola. And in crop will be Liquid Achieve and Pixaro. 
So for our barley silage inputs, uh, we got uh, significantly lower than corn. Um, for $100 of fertilizer, 50 for seed and seed treatment, and uh, 60 for our pesticides. For our overall costs, uh, again, the biggest difference being our inputs uh, compared to our corn silage and our custom expense uh, being a lot lower. So on to malt, bar malt barley for the, this year's growing season. It'll be located on LC17, which is 95 acres. So 95 acres, like said, it'll be planted to an AAC synergy with a yield goal of 90 bushels per acre and an option to silage if it does become too lodged. So for any pesticides, our seed treatment will be Raxel Pro, again a pre-seed of pre-pass XC, an in-crop of Liquid Achieve and Pixaro Tank Mixed, a fungicide of Prozero XTR to help with any Fusarium head blight, and this is all also weather dependent for the fungicide. If it's a hot, wet year this upcoming growing season, it'll more than likely be applied. Our pre-harvest is going to be a swath. Um, unless maturity is completely even amongst the field, then it will be straight cut. And our growth regulator is going to be MODIS, which Demo will talk about later on in the presentation. Our fertility plan, once again, based off of our fall soil samples and our yield goals, will be a 65-2015 blend. And it should be noted that liquid manure was spread on LC17 in the fall of 2022 at 4,000 gallons per acre. So again, as plan A for this crop is malt barley, although if uh, we have pressure due to low amounts of silage, um, and we'll take this field and put it to silage later, we are planning a uh, $100 of fertilizer. This is, again, lower, but due to field fertility, um, it needs uh, higher amounts of fertilizer in order to achieve that uh, baseline. The other costs are gonna be very similar to our barley silage except for the added cost of our modus in our pesticide. For our overall malt barley cost, um, again, very similar to the other silage costs, aside from our insurance inputs and our custom expenses. Oh, right, that's me. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> Our uh, projected income for our malt barley, assuming it makes malt, uh, is going to be about $700 an acre. Our uh, expenses, as previously mentioned, is going to be $520. Gives us a net margin of $180. That is on the low side compared to the rest of our commodities. However, um, the biggest uh, point of us growing an option crop is in case uh, we end up with uh, feed pressure. That way we can turn around and silage it. Our break-evens, uh, if we get our expected price, we will need about 74 bushels an acre. And if we uh, hit our expected uh, yield goals, then we'll need uh, $5.20 a uh, bushel in order to uh, break even. All right, I'd like to open it up for any questions. Uh, yes. Okay, so the question was, our comparative farming cost is the same for all our commodities. However, the cost of farming is variable. Uh, what factors go into our cost of, or our comparative farming costs? I will turn that one over to Alex. So our uh, comparative farming cost is developed by looking at a lot of um, the government uh, printed uh, crop production guides. So in there, they'll have a lot of different breakdowns based off of uh, your land tax, equipment purchases, and uh, utilities. These costs are very difficult to associate on a field-by-field -field basis. So uh, it basically gets summed up and averaged as a flat rate across the entire farm. That's why uh, from each commodity, they don't change. Um, they stayed at $160 from last year to this year as uh, for uh, both of them. We actually looked at the 2022-2023 um, costs and uh, based it off of those as there was a lot of work going into figuring out what the most appropriate amount would be. Um, so that's why it's the, the same for both years as well.
All right, thank you very much. So before we get into our intermission, I would just like to call up uh, Harold Haugen, Tom Jackson, and Gordon Tuck from Zone 5 Pulse Growers, Alberta Pulse Growers, to present a scholarship. Along with that, I'd like to bring up Tanis Herzog, the winner of the scholarship. I guess this is a real uh, honor for us to come and make this presentation. Uh, Harold and I have been here a few years doing this, and uh, it's uh, a very interesting day, and it's great to meet some of the people who have outstanding uh, learning programs. And with that, uh, I pass this over to Tanis, and uh, I guess we just hope that everything goes well. Oh, I'm good. <laughs> With that, thank you very much, and uh, hopefully this will continue on for future years. So, uh, Harold and I might not be there the next years, but what the heck is. <laughs> so, thank you again. Bye. Thank you. Great. So, now is our 15-minute intermission, so if you want to get up, stretch your legs. We do have snacks and drinks in the cafeteria. If you don't know where the cafeteria is, it's right out these top doors and all the way down the hallway. See you in 15 minutes.
All right, welcome back, everybody. Uh, we are the PEAS team this year. My name's Mason Edwards. I'm from Nakoma, Saskatchewan, and I was a part of the analysis team this year. My name's Cale Perkins. I'm from Wayne, Alberta, and I was on the production team. I'm Zachary Tennant. I'm from Balfe, Alberta, and I was on the marketing team. So last year, uh, they seeded PEAS on LC26A and LC12. Uh, they, tar or they seeded 180 pounds per acre, and they targeted seven to nine plants per square feet, and they seeded CDC yellow canary peas. For their pesticide plan, their seed treatment was Trilax Everglow. Their pre-seed was glyphosate and Viraxor. Their in-crop was Viper ADV and Assure. Their fungicide was Dolero, and their burn-off was Reglo. Uh, they did, targeted 60 bushels an acre, which would have brought it to 10,020 bushels total. Uh, they looked at the moisture and the soil fertility, and that's what they came up with. Their blend last year was just 15 FOSS with the nitrogen being inherent, and that's based off soil samples and yield target, and they went with a Nutri-Egg Boss granular inoculant. So the harvest this year, uh, it was actually harvested before we got here on August 24th. Um, the peas were put into aeration bins to manage the hot temperatures that when they were combined, because the seed came off very hot and yeah, monitored the temperature and moisture. Uh, the, this here is the, uh, how our yields compared to others in the area with the same variety of CDC canary peas. You can see uh, the college here, we averaged 49 bushels per acre and others in the area were 39 bushels per acre. So when we got here in the fall, the last year students made three contracts with Viterra, one for 30.5 metric ton and two for 23 metric ton each. So their prices ranged from $11.29 a bushel all the way to $13. So the first stuff was hauled in August, and that's just because the bin was full and they had the cart full in the truck, so they decided to haul it in. And then we got the privilege to haul the rest in August, or in uh, October. So for us, the peas, we hauled them in, or 100 metric ton in November for $13, and then we had 30 metric ton left, and we sold it for $13.25. As you can see here, we did pretty good on the, on the peas. Um, Richardson stopped halfway, and that's just because they stopped taking peas. So the yellow pea input costs here, seed seed treatment was $64 per acre, fertilizer and inoculant $22 per acre, and pesticides at $84 per acre for a total input cost of $170 per acre. Uh, the yellow peas cost per acre, uh, equipment and repairs was $30 per acre, inputs $170 per acre, Custom work, $33 per acre. Insurance, $43 per acre. And the comparative farming cost of $160 per acre. Uh, the 2022-2023 financial summary, uh, income was $645 per acre. Expenses was $438 per acre. And a net profit of $207 per acre. Our 2022-2023 break even at our 49 bushels per acre was $7.62 a bushel. This year we're seeding peas on LC25 uh, and LC26B. And we're targeting seven to nine plants per square feet and we're seeding 190 acres of the CDC yellow canary. And we're reusing our seed from last year and we're seeding at 220 pounds per acre. This year's seed treatment, we went with Trilex Everglow again. Uh, Pre-seed is Valterra and glyphosate. In-crop is Viper and UAN. Our fungicide is Dolero and our pre-harvest is Raglone on LC25, and on LC26B, it's, we're either gonna do Raglone or glyphosate, depending on the perennial weed pressure. Target yield for this year, we targeted 60 bushels an acre, and that relies heavily on the fertility and moisture of this coming year. Uh, pea fertility, uh, we are putting 25 FOSS, with the nitrogen being inherent. That's also based on soil test and nutrient levels and we're going with tag team inoculant. So we decided to do some uh, fall pricing for some peas here. So we did 50 tons at 11.40 for August and September delivery, and that's uh, for a GPO. So the projected 2023-2024 input costs, seed and, treatment, seed and seed treatment at $50 per acre, pesticides at $90 per acre, and fertilizer and inoculant at $30 per acre. Uh, projected cost, equipment repairs, $50 per acre, inputs, $170 per acre, custom, $35 per acre, insurance, $45 per acre, and comparative farming cost of $160. 
Uh, the projected 2023-24 financial summary, projected income of $750, projected expenses of $460 per acre, and a net profit of $290 per acre. And our projected break-evens, at expected yield of 60 bushels per acre, we would need $7.66 <laughs> per bushel. All right, any questions? Uh, the question was, we based our yield targets on 60 bushels per acre, and we're wondering when the last time we hit 60 bushels per acre was. I'm going to pass that question to Kale. Uh, to be honest, I'm not sure. Um, if any of my fellow classmates know, then... But uh, that's, I think, we think this year that's an attainable yield goal. That's what we targeted last year. We didn't hit it, but uh, I know places around have hit 60, so... We're just hoping that we get a good year. All right, thank you. Up next is Hemp and Flax. Hello everyone, we are the Flax and Hemp team. My name is Tanis Herzog, I'm from Camrose, Alberta, and I was on the crop demo team. Uh, my name is Reese Roslin, I'm from Wayward, Saskatchewan, and I was part of the production team. I'm Logan Garnier, I'm from Vermilion, Alberta, and I was part of the mixed farm team. I'm Mason Lavoie, I'm from Peace River, Alberta, and I was the marketing manager this year. So flax production, our flax was planted on LC20, which is 109 acres located four miles south of the main campus on Highway 41. Our variety was CDC glass, which is known to be high yielding and have a strong straw strength. And both our seed and seed treatment was generously donate, donated to us by George Winnie. So our seeding and fertility, we went in with a yield target of 30 bushels per acre. So in order to come up with that, we went in with a bit of a higher seeding rate of 48 pounds per acre. And our seed treatment was Ensure Pulse, which protects against seed rot, root rot, and seed blight. And our fertilizer blend was 4520010, where we seed placed the phosphorus and side banded both uh, the nitrogen and sulfur. So for our pesticides, before I get into this, I will mention that LC20 is extremely weedy. Um, that's likely due to the three heavy applications of manure in the past two years. Um, each time is applied at both 10 ton per acre. Um, so in order to clean up our field, since flax is a weak competitor, we went in with a pre-seed of Authority 480 and glyphosate. In crop, we went in with Assure 2 and Curtail M to clean up our both our broadleaf and grassy weeds. And then for pre-harvest, we went in with Roundup. Uh, so our flax harvest, as I mentioned before, our yield target was 30 bushels per acre. And we came in just shy of that, about one bushel at 28.9 bushels per acre, giving us a total yield of 80 metric tons. And we harvested at 8 to 8.5 percent moisture content, but it is important to note that if we would have harvested at 10 percent moisture content, we would have achieved our yield goal. Uh, so some harvest considerations. Uh, it was the last field combined on October 14th, and as you can see from this picture here, this is kind of the main reason growers avoid <laughs> flax. Um, so we did have some issues with plugging up, as you can see. Um, and from the residue left behind, we were able to get 96 straw bales off of there, which are being utilized by the central feed team. And as I mentioned before, um, with the heavy manure applications, it's kind of been the dumping grounds of the school the past two years, um, which did cause some variability issues, seeding issues in our field. Um, so we did expect some issues with uh, emergence and stuff. So considering that, we are quite happy with how well our flax performed. 
taking a look at the market uh, for flax this past year. Flax uh, market's seen a really big decline in the past year, largely to do to throughout COVID. Uh, Flaxseed oil was used largely as a dietary supplement, and then also in dog food, so the demand within North America was extremely high, yet uh, the export demand for, uh, to China remained about the same level. So we've seen a large drop from the high 30s down to the low 20s. And we ended up selling at a price of 1650 picked up in yard to North Battleford, and the bales went to Central Feed. Now looking at our input costs, um, we spent $54 on pesticide and $80, $88 on fertilizer, and then also to note the $40 an acre would have been our seed cost if it hadn't been donated. And then looking at our total cost breaker, our comparative farming costs at $160 an acre, our inputs at a total of $142, and then our insurance at 21, equipment at 34, and custom at 24, which brings us to a total of $408 uh, per acre cost. So looking at our financial summary, our cost per acre, our income per acre was $467. Our expense with the seed donated was $383. Uh, if you count with this, if the seed hadn't been donated, it would have been $423, which would have brought us to a net margin of $83 for us, but the average uh, farmer would have been uh, closer to the $43. And that brings us to a total of $9,000 total. and. Uh, for the average farmer would have been closer to $4,800. And this is also well ahead of our break even by $3 an acre, because um, we sold at the 1650 to North Battleford. Okay, so uh, this year, being part of the production team, we wanted to try something uh, a little new and, and different, so we decided to go with hemp. Um, so we're gonna try to do in hemp on uh, LC13. This will be the self self part of it. Um, it'll be a total of 36 acres and uh, we'll be doing a, a fiber variety. So uh, our yield target will be around two and a half tons an acre. Um, we'll be seeding it at about 50 pounds to the acre and our fertility blend will be 40, 15, 15, 10. Um, so for pre-seed it'll be glyphosate with um, Express SG or Conquer as well as Edge as an option and then um, in crop will be Assure2 and uh, Partner. Um, so our projected yield, like I said, will be around two and a half, three tons to the acre. Um, it'll be heavily reliant on the weather and the land quality. Uh, this year we'll be going through Canadian Rocky Hemp, and they pretty much do everything for you. They come and rake the hemp, then bale it, and they come and pick it up and deliver it to their own fiber plant. They also supply you with an agronomist throughout the growing season. Our projected hemp input costs are $31 an acre for pesticides and $110 an acre for fertilizer. Our signing payment is $10 an acre, or just $10. Crop insurance is $10, equipment is $35, and our inputs will be $141. Our income is $553 an acre. Our expenses should be about $196 an acre which leaves us with a net margin of $375 an acre. Alrighty, thank you. Is there any questions? Um, so the question is where is the Canadian Rocky uh, hemp from? And I'll pass this one on to Reese. Um, so I don't know the exact location, but they're just outside of Edmonton and they travel within a 150 kilometer radius um, to do these type of contracts, so. <laughs> um, the question was, we didn't put any value on the 96 uh, bales of straw from the flax. And the, the flax is um, kind of a problem for most farmers after like the flax straw, sorry, the flax straw is sort of a problem for most farmers is to do its wiry and you have to do a, either a passive tillage or commonly burning the field. So the cost to get it baled was uh, covered by central feed as well as we sold it for therefore nothing to central feed. It was more so a transfer. Helped us, out, us, helped us both out, they got bales and we got our residue issue solved. Hypothetically, I believe it was sold for nine dollars per bale. Uh, yep. Yeah. Uh, 
I, d I don't really know how to answer that question, so. Good idea. Uh, yeah, up top. Um, so the question is, are we working with the livestock uh, teams to worry about the weeds coming out of the manure? And I will pass that one on to Marcy. Yeah, so you bet. This year, um, it was really brought forth to us that we had a, a bit of a miscommunications happening the last couple of years. So this coming year, we have quite a few pasture fields that are um, needing a little bit of nutrient supplied, so we are going to be putting it onto the pastures and actually give our cropland a little bit of a break. Um, does that answer your question? Um, I'll pass it on to Crop Demo then, thank you. So hello, we are the Crop Demo Group. My name is Austin Beard. I'm from Carsland, Alberta, and I was on the Crop Demo Group this year. Hello, my name is Sid Bandiola. I'm from Edmonton, and I'm from the Mix Farm team. I'm Carly Bester. I'm from Innisfil, Alberta, and I was on the Crop Demo team. I'm Serena Griffin. I'm from Middle Lake, Saskatchewan, and I was also on the Crop Demo team. All right, 2022 manure trial. So this trial happened in LC12, and why we did this trial is to see if there's a difference between beef, dairy, synthetic fertilizer and its soil characteristics and yield potential. How we collect this trial is by dockage, moisture, yield, and bulk density. So three tons per acre was applied on LC12 on April 29th, 2022. Uh, Three replications with four randomized treatment. What I mean is rep one is going to be synthetic fertilizer, horse, beef, and dairy. And then rep two is going to be randomized. And rep three is also randomized. So this is the replication data, not to be confused with the manure data itself. And as for yield, replication one yielded 5311 bushels per acre. Replication 2 yielded 55.45 bushels per acre. Replication 3 yielded 59.32 bushels per acre. The manure trial. So the difference between all the four manure is that horse yielded the best with 57.25 bushels per acre. Peas. So we, um, oh, so the, uh, even though that the horse manure is said by the trial that it got the best bushel and acre return, it was just due to the high variability in that field. The field is very variable, and especially where we were, we were on top of the hills, and looking at the replication data, you can see how much variation there was just next to where they were. So these are our bulk density tests for the spring versus the fall. We didn't see much of a difference, but one trend that we did pick up on was over the summer, the bulk density seemed to decrease in that due to just the soil loosening up, growing the plants and other things that happened during the spring such as the drill going through and tillage and such. So last year's crop demo team planned a BASF trial. This trial was done on LC17 and it was on the south end of the field. It was a Liberty Link plot and the rest of the field was Roundup ready. However, there was a miscommunication on our part with the sprayer applicator and the Liberty Link canola plot did get sprayed out unfortunately, 
but we did learn a very valuable lesson that we probably shouldn't be planting a Liberty Link canola plot in the middle of a Roundup field. So our tillage demonstration this year, we had a Selford Halo 33-foot disc. It was graciously donated by Webb's Machinery here in town. Uh, we pulled it with our T9600 New Holland tractor that was also from Webb's Machinery. We had this on LC12 in the pea field. We wanted to do, use it there to break up some of the pea stubble and ma just make sure that we could get through it next spring with the drill without any plugging problems. We invited all the first years out there to uh, just have a look and see what some of the fields look like on the farm. Okay, so we also had the opportunity to do a stoller trial. It was on LC20, which was our flax field. Um, due to the over application of manure, we have deemed these results as un, um, we're just like not too certain. And we, we would much rather try again with stoller than uh, make a clear decision here. Um, but it was uh, two products, uh, Excite and Bioforge applied at 250 mils an acre at the water volume of 10 gallons an acre. It was on a 7.35 acre trial with six strip treatment strips. Three of them treated, three of them untreated with a 5.4 bushel um, acre difference towards the untreated side. Uh, a couple learning experiences we brought back from this was uh, just how different trials can be set up in the field, how to harvest them. Uh, we did have to clean all of the seed by hand, so uh, we it's, it's pretty crucial going into the um, egg industry. I think it was overall a pretty, pretty good trial. So this upcoming year, our crop demo team plan is to have two trials going on, and our first one being MODIS. MODIS is a growth regulator that we are planning to spray on our malt barley this year, which is going to be on LC17. So MODIS basically is just going to hopefully strengthen and shorten the stems so that we can prevent any lodging from happening that's happened in previous years. This trial is going to be on, like I said, LC17, and it's going to be in a 20-acre plot on the south end of the field, and it's going to be done in a strip trial. Uh, we're also going to be looking at ANVIL, which is a nitrogen inhibitor. Uh, we want to get ahead of the fertilizer emissions, as that's a pretty big thing in our industry right now. Um, it's going to be put on LC18 on the north side. It's a 12-acre trial of three replications with the four random treatments, or four randomized treatments. The first treatment's going to be um, no ANVIL on the fertilizer. Second treatment will be the regular rate of ANVIL. The third treatment's going to be 40% above the regular rate, and then the fourth treatment's going to be 40% below. Um, our big goal here is just to see if we can expand our knowledge in nitrogen uptake and uh, really decrease the volatilization issues we're having. Any questions? Up there? Janet? Okay, uh, the question was, any issues with using pro-till and, um, sorry, what was the end of that? A high-speed disc. Okay, uh, I'm going to pass this one to Austin. So this is always taken into consideration, as should any tillage be taken into consideration. We did this, this is why we did a whole bunch of spot tilling and didn't just go out and do the whole field because, well, it's out there now. So we did just little spots of the field where we thought that we might have problems where we're going to get through with the drill and other places where we thought that the crop might not have perfect emergence. Add to that, we also, where we were doing the pro-tailing, the peas had lodged, so we really wanted to break that up, break the residue up so that we can see through it this year with the drill. Yeah, what do you? Uh, it was 5.4 bushels less for the untreated, but we had so much variability, and where that trial was situated was right in the middle of the field where most of our manure um, kind of clogged up the drill when we were seeding it. So 
it, yes, it, it was 5.4 bushels to the untreated side, but we'd much rather do a trial again to see the actual results than say that that's the definite answer. Any other questions? Yeah, um, so the question was, if, if we're looking at redoing a manure trial, uh, I can answer this one. So far, there hasn't been much discussion on it, but I know that we're moving manure around from pastures to cropland, and then we're trying to do some crop rotations and stuff. So definitely in the future, I think there might be, but as of right now, we're just trying to figure out where we want to put the manure first. Any other questions? Over here. Is the general attitude of the college one of tillage or no-till? <laughs> uh, the question was, is the general attitude of the college no-till or tillage? Um, right now, we're really pushing the four R's. So we're just trying to be the most um, effective and efficient and making sure that we're reading our soil tests and really looking at our soils instead of just going in there and doing the entire field, we'd much rather um, look at issues, like issue problem areas, rather than doing the entire field. Oh, and Marcy's got more for that. Yeah, so just to add to that, we did quite a bit um, discussion this year with our whether or not we wanted to do tillage. Um, it was a drier year, and as we all know, you are going to drain your soil resources the more you till. Um, if you till and it is windy, you can have some soil erosion issues as well. So I would say as a general um, conception of our SMF, we are kind of in the middle. There is definitely a spot and a place for tillage. Not always are you going to need it. Not always is it going to be beneficial. But in terms of when we did choose to use it was when we had really lodged areas and areas where we're going to just have super uneven emergence in the following year with our seed. Um, we chose not to do it excessively, um, again, just to conserve our soil moisture and allow our soil to breathe a little. Does that answer your question? Perfect. Yeah, absolutely. So the question was, how come we're not putting our phosphate with our nitrogen and instead seed placing it? So that's a great question. Um, nit er, phosphorus is immobile in the soil, so keeping it closer to your seed allows your roots to get um, to your pop-up effect a little faster with your phos. We did ensure that all of our phosphorus rates were seed safe before we went ahead and, and made our plans. Um, but yeah, basically just to get that pop-up effect and allow our roots of each plant to reach to that seed quickest or reach to that fertilizer quickest. Questions? Sweet. Um, up next is conclusion. Thanks, guys. All right, well, welcome to our conclusion. Once again, I'm Jace Hansen, this year's general manager. And I'm Rebecca Gardem, this year's assistant general manager. So to start off, this is kind of a final graph we have for our 2022-23 uh, finances. We have our income at $387 an acre for a total of $462,208. Our remaining inventory, which I believe some was sold today, uh, was at $260 an acre or $310,122. Our expenses at $483 an acre are $576,164. And our net margin at $164 an acre or $196,165. So for our projected finances, this is an average within all of our crops for the future. 
Um, so our crop income, we're expecting it to be around $698 an acre with a total of $841,341. Our expenses, we're also expect, we're expecting them to be $517 per acre with a total of $623,806. And then our net margin, we're expecting it to be $181 per acre with a total of $217 or $217,000. $535. So our capital purchases. So these are some things that we've discussed in class that we could either acquire or replace on the SMF to uh, help our farm run a bit smoother or more efficiently. So number one on our list was our flex header. So in the past years, we have uh, rented a flex header from Webs, and we were very gracious for that. And we feel that by purchasing one, we would uh, maybe not have to worry about availability come harvest. And uh, yeah, that's the reason that's number one on our list. Uh, number two on our list is our truck. So as you can see pictured here, we have old blueberry up here. And uh, it's been a great truck. Before we got our orange truck, it was actually our main machine. And it hauled all of the grain for many years. And uh, many kids learned to drive standard in it. And the transmission showing that. So uh, we're looking for a truck, preferably a three-ton automatic with hydraulic brakes. So this would allow anyone with a Class 5 license to drive it, and you wouldn't need that air endorsement. Next on our capital purchase list is grain bins. So we have a few old uh, flat bombs kicking around with some wood floors, and they're showing their age as well. And uh, we're really lucky that we got to put grain in almost all of our bins this year. and. Um, we had to do some patching to get ready for harvest. So this is just a picture of uh, one of our plywood and spray foam patches to get ready for the big yield coming in. And so we were definitely looking into uh, maybe either repairing some of these bins or even expanding our storage with some new hoppers. And uh, last on our capital purchase list is a land roller. So every year we plant our corn crop, our pea crop, and we're rolling both of those crops. and. Uh, so we saw that as a viable option for a purchase on the farm. So just coming to an end here, I'd just like to say thank you to um, a couple people, uh, New Holland Agriculture for the machinery, as well as Webb's Machinery for helping us out with that, uh, Roy Kibitza, Judy Sweet, Armin and Rita Mueller for the land donations, as well as I'd like to thank all the advisors for helping us and putting up with us through the year and farm staff for also helping us a lot. Jaden and Leroy have helped us a lot throughout the year, as well as to all the students for making it really easy to work with all you guys. And it was a fun year, so just thank you guys for that. Any questions? Yep, right up the front. All right, so the question was, have we looked into maybe acquiring a disc drill and a stripper header to uh, keep our stubble a bit longer and keep more moisture? Is that correct? So that is not one thing that we looked at for our capital purchases anyway. However, we have learned the importance of keeping that stubble nice and high and uh, the lower disturbance, keeping that thatch on the ground. And uh, we can really see the importance of that in the last few years, how dry it's been. So. That is definitely something that we can uh, discuss perhaps after this as a class in one of our general meetings. But thank you for your question. Anyone else? Up in the back.
Okay, so the question was, are we going to use our, if we were to acquire a land roller, would we use it uh, for more than just our corn and our peas? And that's a great question. Um, so if we did acquire one, I'd say we could probably use it uh, for just about any crop that we grow on ALO1, because that one seems to just grow rocks sometimes. So we could maybe save a couple guards on that piece by uh, rolling that land. But uh, wherever it would be applicable, I guess, if, you, if we ever seen those rock issues coming up, or even pastures, if they want to level something out. Any other questions? So the question was, uh, why did we put liquid manure on our malt barley field? Because that could affect the protein. Uh, do we have any, Marcy, do you want to come answer this? Yeah, you bet. So when we went through our, um, I guess I've done it. When we went through our crop rotation, we went through each field individually, ensured that our like soil samples would be okay with the following year, and what had already broken down into the soil was just fine. So, on that respect, we think we should be okay. Um, it wasn't at too high of a rate, so we should should be okay. Any other questions? All right, thank you everybody for listening. Before we end here, I'd like to call up uh, Tracy Quinton, our intern dean of ag sciences for some closing remarks. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's, I've had an opportunity to be involved with Student Managed Farm for a lot of years. Not as many as Peter, but uh, I'm getting close to that. And every year they're, they're wonderful and great and I, I really appreciate the students and their effort and their desire to do a good job. They set, they set the bar for the first years and I think it's a, it's a really good bar that was set. I also want to thank our, our faculty. I, I know the number of hours that they commit to making sure this event goes off really well. I've been there, I wasn't there as often this year as I have in the past, but I know, uh, and I, I should share that our, our faculty are here a lot of times from 4.30 after classes till eight or nine o'clock at night, making sure that uh, the students are well prepared and confident when they come up on stage. Um, it's, it's, I have a, I have a, I always tell people and, and uh, parents that it's really fortunate. One of the things we, we have as faculty is we get to see students come in their, in their first year and see how frightened and scared they are to come up on stage. And even up until a week ago, we, we sometimes will question, is, is somebody even gonna be able to stand up and speak? And, and they do a phenomenal job, and I know most parents will appreciate that. that I've heard lots of comments through the years, they can't believe that's their son or daughter up on the stage speaking. And lots of pictures and video are actually taken. Even today, I was sitting back and seeing parents do that. So um, that's, a, that's a really cool experience to have, and I'm, I'm, I am, I'm grateful that I've been able to participate in that as well. So I just want to, again, congratulate the students. You did an awesome job, and, and uh, it's, uh, it's great. I know it's terrifying when you're getting questions out of the audience, um, but it's what a great experience and what a great education uh, you've been able to, to experience doing this. So, and, and again, I want to thank our, uh, give our faculty a, a big round of applause for all the work that they've done as well. Really want to thank the support of, of New Holland. Honestly, uh, in my years here, we might not have Student Managed Farm without uh, the donation from New Holland. It really has made uh, a, a, 
a, a lifesaver for, for Student Managed Farm and the support that they give. So again, Scott, uh, and, and really appreciate the efforts that you have put into to making sure that this can, can carry on. And so we really do appreciate that as well. And I guess last but not least, I'll, I'll, I'm not, I don't want to stand up here for too long, but really uh, appreciate the, the college and our senior leadership as well for supporting the program and, and being able to provide uh, us as, as faculty in the School of Agriculture as an opportunity to, to experience Student Managed Farm and to continue that on. And there's a lot of support behind the scenes for, for our students and for this, this type of engagement for them. So again, appreciate all the efforts that's, that have gone forth and uh, look forward to, to having some fun after this and I know some of the students are, are extremely glad that this is done so uh, uh, enjoy your time and uh, hopefully we'll see you on Monday in classes so that's that's the goal okay thank you everyone